So I'm going to go over no reflow today. Uh, no reflow is a big issue. If it can happen in, uh, especially in acute MI cases and patients frequently became unstable, it may increase the length of your procedure by several minutes to hours. It can also cause patient to develop significant damage to their uh, myocardium. Therefore, you really need to um, know how to deal with it. I'm going to go over a few things and then I'll go over my own technique, what I use with no reflow. But first, you need to know the risk factors. Okay. The, there, there are several risk factors for this. I can tell you uh, big risk factors are LAD disease, young patient. Okay. If it's more proximal lesion. Now, people say LED is a big risk factor. If you ask me, RCA is also equally involved in this um, in terms of no re reflow. However, the studies have shown LED is more uh, prone to develop no reflow. High LV EDP. Okay? If you're starting with an EDP of 30 plus, high chances for that the patient will develop no reflow because the diastolic pressure determines the flow. So if your diastolic pressure in the aorta is like 50 and your diastolic pressure inside of the heart is like 30, you only have a perfusion pressure of like 20. So very important for that diastolic blood pressure to be on the lower side. Um, again, females are at higher risk. Um, in my experience, I think males are also equally prone to this. Um, large thrombus burden is a big one. If there's TIMI zero flow to begin with, again, a big risk um, in those patients. Uh, SVG grafts, patients with bradycardia, and there's, there's a lipid-rich plaque, big risk. Especially young patients, they do not have a lot of calcium. They are at high risk of developing uh, no re reflow because the substance that gets embolized to the distal end of the artery includes not just thrombus, but also a lot of lipid-rich plaque, which is not going to go away with, with just uh, heparin injections or uh, antiplatelet therapy. So like I said, prevention is the best cure. Uh, how can you prevent? Do not over dilate the stent. Okay, so sometimes people love to use IVUS early in their career, which is fine. But if you see a lipid rich plaque, you know, do not over dilate. Then there's there is overzealous people who keep on using imaging like three or four times during a procedure. Personally, you know, you need to really size the vessel by the eyes, and then after that, post dilate based on the on the I was uh, sizing. Uh, if you're not good at it, I understand, you know, in the first year of your uh, being an attending, it's a good idea to do more and more imaging so your eyes get calibrated. However, over time, in MI cases, try to not use imaging with the thrombus in there because it's going to displace it. Uh, like I said, do not use too many runs of IVUS. Each run causes distal embolization. Use imaging after placement of stent not before it in STEMI. Um, and also do not do a lot of injections because what is injection doing? It's causing ischemia every time. It is also a sticky material and it causes, um, uh, it, there's no heparin in your contrast. So it is, the, I mean, they say it's not thrombogenic, but I personally, I think it is thrombogenic if you keep on injecting quite a bit. Doctoring is, and this would be controversial. People may say that, uh, you know, uh, I'm not right about it because daughtering has been used for thousands of years. Um, I personally do not like daughtering where they push the thrombus distally. Um, I avoid daughtering if if there is a lot of thrombus. However, if there's a situation there that you know you cannot see where the vessel uh, lesion ends, daughtering helps to push the thrombus away so that you can see where the lesion is and you can stent it. Now, daughter, uh, Dr. Daughter was uh, a person who did this in the peripheral vessels where he would push with a catheter 
uh, with increasing size of catheters through a thrombus, hence uh, pushing the thrombus or, or the vessel and dilate it further and further over with the uh, with the, um, on with increasing size of catheters. This came from that uh, that kind of uh, you know practice. However, in the coronary vessels, I personally do not feel daughtering is a great way to go. If you have enough equipment present uh, available, such as thrombectomy catheters uh, or penumbra or something like that, if there's too much burden, especially in the RCA, start with thrombectomy first. I, I believe it or not, it will save you from a lot of trouble. Okay, do not let the patient's systolic blood pressure drop below hundred or their heart rate below 50, you know, heart rate below 50. If the heart rate drops below 50, give them atropine. It's okay to give atropine 0.5 milligrams. Just give it to them. Yes, they will become tachycardic. If if their blood pressure is dropping, start on dopamine or levofed. Uh, dopamine of 10, levofed of 0.1. Just, just remember these numbers and just start them. Be, be there to prevent their nausea, vomiting, diarrhea that may start happening on the table. So you'll thank me later for this. Um, so the other thing that you have to remember is that if you are expecting any of these risk factors, okay, give these people adenosine, okay, or nitroglycerin. Or sometimes I even, even give, if there's a large thrombus burden, tyrofibin, everything intra uh, coronary. Now there's a big movement. They say, okay, you need to, give this distally with a microcatheter. But I can tell you, if you're giving through microcatheter, it really trickles down. Uh, you need to really have a shorter syringe and you keep on pushing over a long period of time. Um, I give it through the, directly through the catheter and usually it works. But yes, if you give it to the distal bed, there may be some benefit. Uh, however, it does take time to put the microcatheter down. It's an expense. Uh, so you can give it through the directly through the guide extend, guide liner or guide extension or through the actual guide catheter. Uh, adenosine, I just want one word of caution. You know, some people give only 60 micrograms, 120 micrograms. So how do you know it's enough? If there's a heart block, that is when it's enough, okay? You need to see on the ECG, there's, there needs to be a heart block. That is where, you know, you need to stop. Otherwise, keep on giving 60 micrograms, um, you know, uh, repeated injections to these people. Nitroglycine, again, around 200 to 300. Uh, easy way to remember all these is everything is 200 microgram, okay? Almost everything. Adenosine, 200 micrograms. Nitroglycine, 200 micrograms. Rapamil 200 micrograms, epinephrine, you need to give it slow, okay? Remember, you have to give it slow. Uh, up to the boluses, up to 200 micrograms. Be careful, it can cause VT or torsades. Uh, Nicardipine, again, 200 micrograms. Also, check ACT and try to keep the ACT around 300. Below 350, you don't want the person to bleed, but somewhere in the vicinity of 300. Um, and... Like I said, that if you want to give it through microcatheter, my suggestion will be to give it through pronto, okay, the thrombectomy catheter. Now, you don't want to have thrombus sitting in the catheter and you push it back, okay? So you have to remove it, put it back again, flush it outside first, put it back again, then go and uh, then give it through it. You can also give it, give through a punctured balloon, um, you know, uh, a 2.0 balloon. You can put that in there. And through the port where you have inflation, you can you can in, you can inject these drugs. Now, TPA has been used. However, there is a study. There was a clinical trial. They did not find any benefit of it. However, some people really think highly of TPA. I have utilized TPA. In my experience, it was 50-50. Maybe done around uh, nine or ten cases. Uh, what I did was. So you put two wires on one wire, you put a balloon, okay? Uh, from the other wire, you have a microcatheter going down and on that microcatheter, you can deliver this. 
and you inflate the balloon so that it does not go back. Okay, um, that's kind of blocking balloon technique with a TPA. Uh, you let it marinate for five ten minutes, and then try to aspirate as much as possible. Uh, you can put these people on Kangalore or GP2B in inhibitor for six to twelve hours. I do not do eighteen hours, uh, but twelve hours because there's a real risk of uh, pulmonary hemorrhage in these patients and they bleed quite a bit. Uh, and then bring them back in a day. Try to see, you know, how if you haven't stented, try to see what the vessel is like, and most likely it will be uh, doing well. Uh, ba basically, you really need time for these patients. You do um, see these kind. I've never done this, so you know. Uh, but there are some people who, you know, swear by it that it works. What they do is they remove, they put a central line in, maybe in the femoral axis, try to remove venous blood, and then inject about fifteen to twenty times into into the coronary artery um, over thirty to forty minutes, and they say the flow improves. I'm not sure what's the pathophysiology behind it is, but you know this could be the last ditch effort if you do not have any of the drugs above. Um, sometimes time is only what you need. Okay, another drug which not many people think about is IV Lasix. Bring the EDP down, bring their EDP, dry them up. Okay, that will increase the flow. Okay, you want to have the diastolic pressure go higher so that the flow increases. So you want to also put these people on higher. Um, kind of vasopressor so that the diastolic pressure goes up. Um, and if the EDP stays high, let's say you fail to improve the nodi flow, put a balloon pump, okay? Put a balloon pump or some form of mechanical circulatory support. Um, I prefer balloon pump because sometimes these patients are on tyrofibin um, because of lower bleeding complications. But, you know, Impella is another one that you can do bring their EDP down. And when you are doing this with the MCS, put a right heart cat. Do the full thing, do not let it go because this no reflow will come back and cause you trouble. Many of these patients die, especially if they have SVG no reflow, okay? If they have SVG no reflow, they'll go into heart failure and give you a lot of trouble. Now, I just want to go over, um, I, I call it my Q uh, regimen, uh, which I could patent it. What I do is that I first do thrombectomy with penumbra, okay, cataracts, cataracts catheter, okay. Once I've done this, then I uh, do what I do, and the way I do with cataracts is I, so let's say this is the vessel, this is the lesion, okay, this is no reflow. I park the catheter right here, um, right here, okay? And let it suck for like 20 to 30 seconds. So what I'm trying to get is about 100 ml out, okay? So the jar, I'm, I'm able to see the jar. Now, if you're using Pronto or something like that, you can also get 100 ml out. You really need to get 100 to 200 ml out, okay? Not 200, that's kind of, uh, you know, extra, uh, you know, ex extend, you don't want to exsanguinate the person, but about 100 to 150 ml uh, out. Um, once this is done, then what I do is I check ACT and send the blood out. So I, I, I clear the whole guide out by suctioning at least 10, 15 ml more blood, okay? And then I send this ACT, 10, 15 more blood out, is out. And then what I do is I, by that time, the adenosine is ready, okay? Um, so what I do is, and then I order the adenosine to get it ready, okay? Um, I put about 1,500 to 2,000 micrograms of tyrofibin in, okay? So per ml of tyrofibin is 250 ml. So I put basically 8 ml of tyrofibin IC in there. And I'm not using any microcatheter uh, this is for not with not very severe uh, no reflow, okay? Uh, and it works. It almost works like 90% of times. After the tyrofibin, I give adenosine, and I want to make sure that there's a 
there's a block. So around 200 micrograms of adenosine. And then I want to see that AB block, you know, a P wave followed by no QRS and then Q, uh, QRS. I want to see that. Once I've done this, then I give nitroglycerin. Now, nitroglycerin is not really strictly for no reflow, but sometimes there's vasospasm associated with it. So you want that to go away. Once that is done, then I try to stent. If you can do direct stent, wonderful. If you cannot do direct stent, um, you know, then you can take a puff, a soft puff to see if the vessel is open. And do not give too many puffs after that. So once that is done, uh, most of the time, like I said, 90% of the time things work. Now, if they're not working, then the best data out there is for epinephrine. Okay, now epinephrine will cause a lot of tachycardia. Remember that patients don't really like it. Um, IV LASIK is another one that I give, and then I put the patient on balloon pump, okay, after doing this. Now, you can give nicardipine, 200, again, 200 micrograms. You can give verapamil, 200 micrograms. And there have been one or two cases I've done where verapamil or diltiazem work. Again, what's the dose? 200 micrograms, okay. Once that is done, most of the time it works. And that is it. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, this was suggested by one of my very nice friends on WhatsApp. So that's why I made this video. Um, thank you very much for listening to me.